I'm Freddy Munoz. Uh, I'm product manager at Uncle Inc. And the title of the talk is a little bit different from what you find on your guide sheet. I, I modify it a little bit, but the content is the same. Uh, just the title is different. So, uh, Uncle Inc. is a small startup. Uh, we were a very young startup at Paris, in, just in the heart, just in the dirt. There is Antelink, and we specialize in open source management solutions. Uh, that said, we're a team of seven. We're a very small and tight team. And we maintain and feed the world's largest database, uh, knowledge base of open source components called Antipedia, uh, which hosts uh, more than one million projects, 500 million files, etc., etc. So while we are here, uh, today, uh, this track is about uh, software quality, about the quality in the, in the overall Adobe 2 project. And this is about open source, uh, it's about licenses, and why licenses influence the quality of open source, and the license management influence that, that quality. And the why open source is it's a very simple uh, question that has a very simple answer. There are thousands of enterprise-ready open source projects that has evolved over the last few years. And there are thousands of enterprises eager to use that open source. And actually, according to a, uh, if I am not wrong, it is a Gartner study, uh, oh, perhaps an Accenture study, 80% of those companies that are out there are actually integrated in open source in one way or another. So then, then you, you can ask yourself the question, okay, why caring about uh, open source licenses and license issues in particular? And why is it hard to handle those licenses? And why is it hard to handle those licenses in an industrial setting? and to interoperate with those licenses in uh, open source settings. Uh, there are many reasons why you care about licenses. Uh, why is it hard? The first one is that you need to respect the author's wishes. You need to respect what the author said when he wrote the code, uh, when he produced that piece of code. Perhaps it's a team, a certain organization, and the at some point in time said, I want it to be GPL, LGPL, BSD, MIT, whatever. But the thing is that he cared enough to uh, <coughs> give his software creation a license. And as a reuser of that software, we should care about it. The second uh, problem here, uh, the, the second motivation is that license data that is out there uh, assuming that we, we are eager to respect the author's wishes, it's not pretty reliable. Uh, you can have several incurrences there. Uh, the first one is license changes over time. Here, if, if you can read, I'm not sure if you can read, but here is the evolution of the NTLR project, uh, a very well-known uh, grammar parser, and you see that in version two and version three, the licenses are completely different. Same people, same project different licenses. There is another example of, of this real-world problem, and it is that the license data may be inconsistent. For example, here we have a different excerpt from the GWebmail website. Uh, the first one says that the GWebmail is under LGPL license. Okay, everything is fine. If you go to their source source page, you, you find that they have a mixture of Apache version 2.0 and uh, GPL license. Okay, it's kind of confusing, but still okay, compatible. And then when you go to their uh, about page, it states that the whole software package the bundle is bundled uh, all under the Apache 2.0 license. And if you go either down the code, uh, you will find no reference to any license at all. So this is the kind of complication that we find when we are exploring license and we want to care about them. Uh, license data is inconsistent. Uh, we, we want to respect the out of wishes. Uh, and finally, if we are not complying with license, we can have serious implications. Uh, 
we can have material losses, IP violation, some lawsuits, uh, devaluation, some injunctions, etc. And to uh, illustrate this this problem, let me uh, tell you a story. The story about the BC Box, a case study. I don't know if you know it. BC Box is a small uh, Linux tool chain uh, used to uh, provide some support service in embedded devices. And one day, the BC Box was included in a in a firmware. One day, like any other day, one firmware, like any other firmware. And one day, Westinghouse, a very big manufacturer in the US, included that firmware into their HD TVs. Uh, whether they knew that it, has, it had open source or not, we, we don't know, but they did it, and they did it wastefully. So the guys at VCBox acknowledged this, this, this problem, I mean, this situation. They were never notified about the use of VCBox. So they decided to fill a lawsuit uh, against Westinghouse. The, uh, so they, they went to a lawyer, and the lawyer went to the court, uh, and they started fighting for their own rights. Uh, this happened on December the 14th, 2009. And finally, there was a settlement. A judge decided on August the 3rd that Westinghouse was guilty of IP violation, <clears throat> and it assesses damages to the Visibox project. So, how the, uh, 150 thousand dollars, American dollars, uh, but that's not the real loss there. Uh, the real loss is the inventory. They they have produced dozens of HD TVs, and they lost the profit that they could make out of those HD TVs, and the court. Uh, pronounce an injunction. So uh, and, uh, they forbid Westinghouse to sell the, those TV sets. So they were given to charity. So millions of dollars were lost. Millions of material losses uh, were lost due to a <coughs> small piece of software inside those HD TVs. I, I hope this illustrates the, the risk there.